as my mother who referred Larry to AAPS, and he's been helping build our organization, doing good work for 30 years here now. Uh, he served as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons since 2003. He's a past president of AAPS, current president of the American Health Legal Foundation, and current secretary of AAPS. He has served numerous terms on the AAPS Board of Directors. Dr. Huntoon has also served as the chairman of the AAPS Committee to Combat Sham Peer Review since 2004. He has run the AAPS Sham Peer Review Hotline on a pro bono basis for the past 19 years and has helped numerous victims of sham peer review, which is what he'll be speaking about through information provided on the hotline. The AAPS Sham Peer Review Hotline is a free benefit for AAPS members. Dr. Huntoon is an internationally recognized expert in sham peer review at hospitals and has given numerous lectures on sham peer review, including lectures given in Australia and Israel. Dr. Huntoon is also a court qualified expert in sham peer review and has testified in state and federal cases throughout the nation. In 2017, Dr. Huntoon testified at trial in a federal court in South Dakota where the physician won a jury award of $1.18 million. Uh, there's some more examples here in the notes you have. I can't read all this, Larry. You've done too much. Uh, I will say it was one memorable talk he gave down here in Texas one evening at a, a town hall type format where he had people from the community coming out to see what was happening at their hospital. And Larry told them about sham peer review and how the hospital administrators were causing all the good doctors to leave in their community. And he got the uh, hospital administrators so rattled that one of them stepped up to the microphone and said, wait a minute, we need sham peer review here. We need sham peer review. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Larry Huntoon. Uh, that talk was in Beeville, Texas. So those of you from Texas may know where that is. I think it's south of Corpus Christi, maybe by about 70 miles. And it was on a, uh, a weeknight, I think it was a Thursday, and they held it at a community college auditorium. And I can tell you that auditorium was packed full of people. Because what had happened was the hospital administration didn't particularly like some of the things that some of the physicians were saying about the hospital. And they were basically, those physicians were threatened with being labeled disruptive physicians. And they knew from listening to the AAPS talks that that could lead to real trouble, like the ruin or end of their careers. So as a result, all of the surgeons at that little hospital in Beeville resigned. So that left the community without any surgeons. So the community's thinking, what is going on here? If we have a, an acute appendicitis or something, are, are we gonna have to travel 70 miles away to Corpus Christi to see a surgeon? So they were very concerned. And <clears throat> after, I, uh, after it was a town hall meeting, after the town hall meeting finished, uh, they decided, the people decided, that they needed to form a committee to analyze and evaluate what the hospital administration had been doing. So things basically got better from, from there on. But I digress. I'm here to talk tonight about sham peer review and what AAPS is uh, doing as far as being committed to helping uh, physicians uh, fight back. And let's see here. Uh, the first thing I want to say, because uh, the hospital attorneys who depose me and cross-examine me at trial are always trying to say that I'm against peer review. I'm not against peer review. AAPS is not against peer review. AAPS and I fully support peer review done in good faith. And good faith peer review should be collegial, educational, fair, done for the purpose of improving quality care and protecting patients, and should incorporate substantive due process for the accused physician. So the only kind of peer review that I'm opposed to and AAPS is opposed to is the type that's done in bad faith for some other purpose other than patient care. So let's just review quickly. I know some of you have uh, seen this before, but the definition of sham peer review. It's an adverse action taken in bad faith 
by a professional review body for some purpose other than the furtherance of quality care and that is designed to look like legitimate peer review. And this was published, by the way, in our journal back in 2008, the definition. And this last part, designed to look like legitimate peer review, that sounds a lot like fraud to me, don't you think? That they're, they're, they're trying to say, oh look, we're doing, we're doing legitimate peer review, but it's really not, but they disguise it to look like that. So who are the main perpetrators? We know who they are. They're hospitals, they're medical boards, and even medical specialty boards. Why are they doing it? Well, the underlying motives for sham peer review need not be identified in order to identify the peer review process as being a sham peer review. That's an important point because I've, certain, I've, I've heard some uh, hospital experts say, well, Dr. Huntoon, you haven't identified what the underlying motive is for these people to be doing this bad thing. Well, I don't have to. What we look at is the process to see if it complies with due process and fundamental fairness. And, and quite frankly, a lot of times it doesn't even comply with the process as outlined in their own medical staff bylaws. So peer review, as we all know, uh, does not occur in a vacuum. It occurs in an environment of politics, power struggles, turf battles, strategic business plans that don't include the targeted physician, personality conflicts, personal animus, professional jealousy, discrimination, and conflicts of interest. And independent physicians are uh, being particularly eliminated from hospitals, and this is a, a trend that was exacerbated by Obamacare. And this was an editorial called The Purge that was uh, published in our journal back in 2019. So independent physicians are, are certainly being targeted for sham peer review. Hospitals like, would like, 100% of their physicians on staff to be employed because then they have really complete control over what they do and how they do it. So during the COVID era, we have seen an unprecedented censorship and corruption of medicine where political consensus was substituted for actual science and where government lies and coercion coordinated with the media were used to suppress truthful information which did not comply with the official narrative. Collaboration with medical boards and medical specialty boards resulted in vicious attacks against good physicians by hospitals, medical boards, and medical specialty boards. So the thing we have to know, and you all know, is that consensus is not a substitute for science. You don't vote on whether the earth is round or flat. Science will show you which it is. And clinical practice guidelines are not the standard of care. Although oftentimes they will be abused and labeled as such. Uh, but again, it's nothing more than consensus. People getting together and voting on, well, this is the way we should do things. If you don't do things my way, well, you're practicing beneath the standard of care. And I wrote an editorial on this in the spring issue of uh, our journal in 2023, Sham Peer Review, Abuse of Consensus and Clinical Practice Guidelines. So during the COVID era, what we saw was sham peer review on a massive scale. It's promoted and supported by government administration, health officials, FDA, CDC, and certain states particularly, as, as Andy mentioned, the California Disinformation Bill, AB 2098, which, of course, is no longer. They very quietly repealed it, and Governor Gavin Newsom quietly signed it into law. So AB 2098 in California is gone. Again, uh, some of this massive uh, sham peer review was committed by hospitals, medical boards, and medical specialty boards, again, following the basically the official government narrative. And our general counsel, Andy Schlafly, wrote a good article on this in the fall issue of 2022, Ending Retaliation by Specialty Boards that Certify Physicians, and we have certainly put our efforts uh, behind, uh, behind that. The other thing that you really, uh, I hope you didn't miss, was an open letter to the American Board of Medical Specialties 
and the Federation of State Medical Boards, the destruction of medical boards' credibility. And uh, this was uh, authored by a number of uh, prominent physicians and was published in the fall issue of 2022, basically condemning the actions of medical specialty boards to de decertify good physicians whose views did not support the official government narrative. AAPS is the only National Medical Association that is helping physicians fight back against the growing scourge of sham peer review. We have your back. And a lot of physicians have used what we offer in terms of the limited legal consultation service run by the nation's top attorney in sham peer review matters, Andy Schlafly. They've also availed themselves of the AAPS sham peer review hotline, which I've run now for about 20 years on a pro bono basis. So AAPS recently filed an amicus brief with the Kentucky Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of state medical board deferring to and relying on fact finding by hospitals in sham peer reviews. Uh, this superb amicus brief was done on a pro bono basis by AAPS member Philip Eskew, who has a DO and JD degree and MBA. And uh, I applaud Phil Eskew for doing that. Again, he did it on a complete pro bono basis and it was uh, quite uh, wonderful. So uh, what is happening is you know, some of these um, some of these states and, and whatnot, just like uh, under when you when physicians sue hospitals for sham peer review matters, uh, the they tend the courts tend to defer to you know the hospital. Certainly, the National Practitioner Data Bank, they accept whatever the hospital says as gospel truth. You know they can lie to the National Practitioner Data Bank or, or file false information, which they do. And the National Practitioner Data Bank just simply accepts it. A recent case illustrates just how bad things can get when a false accusation is made against a physician. And this is the case, it's a published case of John Farmer, MD versus Baptist Health Medical Group and Baptist Health Madisonville Incorporated. So this was in Louisville, Kentucky. And, uh, what happened here was that the doctor ended up seeing a couple of patients. He saw a couple of pediatric patients. Their mother was with them. And he, um, every, he went home. Everything was fine. There weren't any problems. Except that shortly thereafter, the mother of those two pediatric patients uh, filed a complaint against the doctor saying that she felt he was impaired because he touched his nose a lot. So touching your nose a lot can get you in really big trouble. And so in this case, what happened was he, he had to submit, he, they were wanting him to submit to, of course, uh, urine and blood testing for alcohol and, and drugs. And he said, fine, I'll go right down the hall here from where we're holding the meeting and, and I'll, I'll do it right here. I want to get, it, uh, get my name cleared. And they said, no, you can't do that. We have to refer you to the PHP, the, the State Physician Health Program, and you can travel three hours to them and, and go, get the, uh, go get the drug and urine testing, uh, which he ended up doing, and it was all completely negative. Uh, but they still uh, decided that he must be guilty of something. I mean, what do you do? He's touching his nose a lot. Well, it turned out he had attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and that was just kind of a little quirk that he, that he had. He wasn't impaired. But he ended up getting, once you get into these physician health programs, they don't let go. And of course, they wanted uh, monitoring, reg routine, regular monitoring for, for drugs and alcohol and all the rest of it. It's just a, a, complete, uh, a complete horror story. And he did end up suing, and he won the case. So this is a, this is a case here that uh, it's, it's published, and where I've taken this uh, information was from the actual court document. And this is a 
an approach that we're looking at right now that is suing individuals for fraud when they've uh, conducted a sham peer review. It's the case of Lou V. Baycare Medical Group uh, and St. Joseph's Hospital and a named physician there. And according to the complaint, uh, April 8th, 2020, Dr. Nayi sent Dr. Liu a letter stating that she must either accept collegial intervention, agree to a 90-day scrub-in requirement, or face emergency suspension of her privileges, which would be reported to the data bank. So let me just stop right there and explain that a 90-day scrub-in requirement is basically proctoring. That means she can't do a procedure without someone scrubbing in with her. And that is fully reportable to the data bank when it goes beyond 30 days. It's, it's a restriction of privileges. She can't practice independently without the proctor. Dr. Nay represented to Dr. Liu that the scrub-in requirement was not a proctorship, but it was not reportable to the data bank, a representation which defendants knew was false. And they will tell you a lot of false things when they've got you in their sights. Look, it's not reportable. Uh, it'll go better for you if you just resign voluntarily. That won't be reportable. They'll, they'll tell all sorts of lies. And if you haven't been listening to some of the uh, AAPS talks and reading the AAPS literature on sham peer review and you go for it, you might find your career ruined or ended. Dr. Liu relied on this representation and agreed to the sanction. Three days later, after she voluntarily agreed to the sanction, defendants reported her to the National Practitioner Data Bank and said specifically that she was subject to a proctorship. So they misrepresented things, right? They said, oh, it's not a proctorship, don't worry about it. And then three days after she agreed to it, oh, well, we've got to report you, it's a proctorship. So, we're, we're looking at, at fraud, suing individuals for fraud as a uh, possible viable approach to uh, changing the way things turn out in these cases. And then there's the uh, Denman uh, case, and I've, I've reviewed that one. I won't do it again here, uh, but I did publish the details of that in the latest issue of our journal 2023, Sham Peer Review, Focus Professional Practice Evaluations, Performance Improvement Plans, and Physician Health uh, Programs. The Denman case is, is basically a case where they falsely accused her of uh, being on alcohol, and it was, it was totally false, and she ended up winning her case. And I think she had a jury award of someone, somewhere in the neighborhood of $2.8 so just a few tips for surviving sham peer review. Contact AAPS early on. If you are not a member, join AAPS. And there's the 800 number that goes right to headquarters. Retain a knowledgeable attorney early on. There are a lot of attorneys out there that do represent themselves as uh, health law attorneys and whatnot. A lot of those attorneys work for hospitals. There are also a number of employment attorneys that sometimes try and take on these cases. And they're, they're not real knowledgeable about the peer review process in hospitals. They don't maybe know about the HICWA law, the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act of 1986. There's a lot of things that they, they don't know and they wade into these cases and maybe provide bad advice for the physician. The other thing is, uh, some of these uh, physicians may end up paying tens of thousands of dollars to educate their own physician, their own attorney, uh, about some of these things like the Healthcare Quality, Im Quality Improvement Act. But one of the things that I think is particularly foreign to attorneys that, that comes to us from the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act is the accused physician is considered to be guilty unless and until he can prove his innocence by a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, some, some attorneys, I think, find that very hard to swallow because, you know, we grew up in a country where it was, uh, you're innocent until proven guilty, but not if you're a physician under the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act. And the other thing is, which we're seeing uh, being used more often, is the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act does include a loser pays provision. 
So if the doctor uh, does not win his case and they then allege that it was done you know, frivolously, it was done without merit, it was done in bad faith, the hospital can go after the doctor to pay for all of its attorney's fees. And I'm seeing that being done more and more, and these are substantial because some of these attorneys for hospitals work for a, a rate of $500 to $1,000 an hour, so it, it builds up very, uh, very quickly. Uh, the other thing you should do is uh, read your medical staff bylaws. Uh, too many physicians just, just don't do this. You need to read the medical staff bylaws, what it says about summary suspensions, about the fair hearing process and appeals. And you need to read and study the resource articles and video presentations which are available on our AAPS uh, website at this link posted here. Because knowledge is power. The more you know about this, the, the better you'll be able to sort of sidestep some of the landmines and identify some of the sham peer review tactics that the hospital's uh, using. And under no circumstances resign while there is an open, ongoing investigation. Uh, I have saved numerous careers of physicians on the AAPS sham peer review hotline merely by providing this information to them because they, they listen to the hospital and the hospital is often encouraging them, oh, it will go better for you if you simply voluntarily resign. You won't have to go through this messy peer review process or appeals. Just, just voluntarily resign. It'll be okay. Sometimes they even lie to the physician and say, well, if you voluntarily resign, it's not going to be reportable. Of course, it is immediately reportable when you resign, when there's an ongoing uh, investigation that has not been closed. So uh, under no circumstances resign while there is an open or ongoing investigation. The other thing I would encourage you to do is, uh, you know, donations to our American Health Legal Foundation, which is really the litigation arm of AAPS, are fully tax deductible and greatly appreciated. And you can donate by either going online, calling our 800 number, or by mail. And again, this is our litigation arm. We do a lot of good uh, through the American Health Legal Find Foundation. This is where the funding comes from for amicus briefs uh, that we do. And we do a lot of amicus briefs, as Andy reviewed, that have really been uh, very helpful. So thank you all for your support.